very much for downloading the 47th episode of the Paltrowcast with Darren Paltrowitz. On this episode, I spoke with three different musicians who are very successful and have new music to speak of, and that's John Dolmayan from the band System of a Down, Rao from Enter Shikari, and Cherie Curry. First up is my interview with John from System of a Down. He's been in System for over 20 years as its drummer, Yet 2020 brings his first ever solo album, and that's called These Gray Men. You could call These Gray Men a covers album, but he and his band, which features a mix of guest vocalists, do these songs in a very original and interesting way. Hearing Surge from System of a Down sing Road to Nowhere by Talking Heads, very, very interesting. And these are also covers by Madonna and Eminem, Two Door Cinema Club, all sorts of genres here are represented. So John and I spoke about these gray men. We also spoke about his comic book store in Vegas. And as this was taped in the middle of the COVID-19 quarantine that was kind of required by the majority states, we spoke about what that was like for him. Very nice guy, very interesting guy, and I think you're going to like this one. Hey, it's Darren for your interview at 3.30 Pacific. Still a good time? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Great. I've listened a lot to these gray men and it's such a great story behind it that you were just looking to have a creative outlet of sorts. But the first thing I wanted to know was whether any of the artists you've covered on the album have reached out to you or any of the songwriters even. They haven't yet. I don't know if they're aware of it, to be honest with you. And um, I was doing an interview and somebody brought up a point, asked if I had sent them to, any of the artists, and I hadn't even thought about that. So, yeah, I think I will send it to them just out of respect and uh, see if they enjoy it. Well, usually publishers of the songs want to have that in their files because then they could pitch it and make you some more money. But it's interesting to hear that that was never even a thought of yours as to what songs get covered and all that. Yeah, you know what? I don't know why. I, it just never occurred to me because um, I think covers are fun and they should be – done without you know any pretenses and just enjoy it but you're right out of respect i should actually send it to them and i would love to hear what they think of it i I'm, i hope that they would enjoy it because i was inspired by their originals so while the album might get pigeonholed as a covers album it's actually really original from start to finish for example you change up the tempo on road to nowhere pretty early into the song but i read that you came up with a lot of the tempos based on hearing in your head how the singer might sing them, for example. Yet the last song on the album, Rock Bottom, is just totally original. When in the whole process did you come up with Rock Bottom? You know, I like that Eminem song a lot. And, uh, and when I listen to it, I love his syncopation. That's what, what makes Eminem so special is the way he syncopates his vocals. He's very much like a drummer in that way. And... Um, but I also thought it would be cool to put a Latin vibe on it because I originally intended for Santana to be on that. I know that's wishful thinking, um, but I like to aim high in life, you know, it, whenever possible. So I reached out to Santana. I never heard anything back on it. Um, it would have been cool to have him play on it, but may, maybe he may one day. And, uh, and I decided just to put it out as an instrumental, primarily because people have been asking me for a drum solo for a long time. So I felt this was a great opportunity to fulfill that need for people to hear a drum solo and the latin vibe of the song made it easier to segue into the drum solo and i read that you pared down the track listing from 30 to 40 different songs did you let the lead singers choose which song they were going to be singing on or did you say here's your track yeah i had songs picked for the lead singers um either by the way they sang what i thought they were capable of the tone of their voice or overall just the vibe of the song 
as it, as it came out after working on it and putting our own taste on it and our own spin on the songs. So I kind of picked each song for each singer. Um, with that being said, there were plenty of songs that I picked for other singers that didn't get recorded because the singers weren't available or did get recorded and just didn't feel right when they were done. So, you know, I didn't release them. I tried to kind of, uh, at, at, at best, put out what I felt was um, the best representation of both the singers that sang on them and the originals themselves. You know, for example, there was a song that I really liked, worked on it, even had a singer come in and sing it. He did a great job, but I just felt like it wasn't different enough from the original. It wasn't interesting enough in general to put it out. So, you know, just um, you have to be your harshest critic, your own harshest critic in general. And that's what I tried to do. And you're definitely all over the place in the best of ways in terms of choosing artists. For example, Two Door Cinema Club, great band. I never think of them in the same sentence as, say, AFI or Madonna. Has that always been how you've been as a music listener and a music fan, listening to everything? Yeah, you know, I'm really open to music, and I listen to everything from, from like, Sia, when it concerns pop, Rihanna, um, you know, uh, to the Rolling Stones, to Beethoven. And that could be just in, in, in one day, you know. Um, I'm also a comic book writer now. I've started up my own series. So I listen to music when I write. And uh, generally speaking, I listen to classical. So it really is all over the place. Um, I know a lot of people say they have a diverse range of music to listen to, but truly mine is diverse in that anytime you're hanging out with me, you might be listening to something completely different. Well, you beat me to it. I was about to ask about the comic book drum set that you'd customized a decade or so ago. Is that still being yeah. played these days? I only played it on one tour just because I was so afraid something would happen to it. You know, like, uh, it, it's pretty easy to steal stuff, and that's irreplaceable. So I just pl played on the one tour, and now I have it displayed at my comic book store in Las Vegas. Wow. Where in Las Vegas is your comic book store? I wasn't aware that you had one. It's in uh, southwest Las Vegas. It's called Torpedo Comics. Right now, we're not open for, to the public, but we have an uh, Instagram account and a Facebook account, and we do live sales, promoting comic books, um, getting through this time when people are at home bored. It's a great way to interact with other fans and uh, buy books and buy interesting things and items, and we have a lot of cool stuff happening. When in your life did you get into comic books versus music? I started wanting to play drums when I was about two, and I discovered my love for comics when I was 12. Got it. Now, a lot of the people that are into comics and music also have that wrestling and MMA overlap. Do you have that as well? Not really. I liked wrestling when I was younger. MMA, I'll watch a fight maybe every two years. Um, I'm more of a football fan when it comes to sports. So, you know, there's only so much time in a day. And I have family I want to hang out with and spend time with the kids. So, you know, I, I limit it to the um, six months or so that football's on. And I really enjoy watching uh, that effort. Plus, I play football, and I enjoy playing football, so I, I think I relate to it more. Makes sense to me. So coming back to the music here, since you had all those songs that you were even brainstorming for the first album, have you even thought about doing a second album yet? Yeah, I may not do a, like a full album or EP, but instead just release songs here and there. There's a song that I really want to cover that I'm working with uh, my friend Frankie Perez, who also played in Scars on Broadway and sang... Uh, one of the songs on this album, uh, Del Shannon's song, actually, called Runaway. But he won't leave the house right now, so um, as soon as things calm down, we're going to get together and, and record at least one more song. And yeah, his track, Runaway, is great. I remember the Traveling Wilburys themselves covered that one back in the day. And going back into your musical exploration, were you a Kiss fan or a hair metal fan? Did you transition from that stuff? I wouldn't say I was a massive Kiss fan or a hair metal fan. I did like some songs. And I like some hair metal bands, um, but I was always a drummer. So I looked at it from a drummer's perspective and those bands just didn't really have drumming that I could look up to or emulate. It was just a little too basic for me. And um, too many drummers during those eras trying to, trying to replicate what uh, Zeppelin did, and it, which is impossible. Bonham had, had touch more than anything else. And he's the most uh, imitated drummer of all time, but, uh, imitated but nobody mastered it like he did you know and it really was just the way he hit the drums 
And I hear a lot of Keith Moon in your playing. I'm not sure if he was one of your main influences there, but you hit hard like yeah, yeah. Bonham, yet you do the kind of Keith Moon fills. Does that require staying in shape or doing a lot of fitness oriented stuff? You mentioned being a football player before. Well, a lot of it is muscle memory. When I was a football player, I only weighed 110 pounds. So it's not like I was running people over, but yeah, a lot of it is muscle memory. I stay in decent shape. I work out trying to lose a couple pounds like everybody else is, you know, got the dad bods going, but in general, I'm in pretty good shape and I got 30 years of playing drums and, you know, after a couple, after two weeks of playing, I'm pretty much back to form. And do you know any other musical projects that you're planning on doing besides this album? I did ask you about the new album and maybe working with Frankie, but could we ever see an all-star touring kind of band where you're at the center of it? You know what? I would certainly be open to that. I got an offer to do a couple of things that just weren't right. But if it was the right offer, I would certainly do it. It takes a lot to get me away from my kids and my wife and family. But for the right project, I would certainly consider. Of course, everyone in the world is going to ask you the status of System, which I'm not going to do. I'm just going to ask, will we see more from System of Down in the future, whether it's touring or recording? Probably just touring. I, I don't see us recording. We're pretty stupid about that. Um, we haven't released an album in 15 years. And I think the people on my band are getting more stubborn, not less stubborn. So it's pretty unlikely to happen. But you're the guy who was able to tour, you know, even when System wasn't touring in a way. So I take it that you do like the road, even if you want to be home with family. I enjoy the part where I get to play live in front of people and, and share that experience with them and share, you know, the love of music. So, uh, yeah, that I do enjoy and, and will always enjoy, um, whether it's with System or another project. And the little I've spoken with you, it sounds like you're happy with the whole quarantine in the sense of getting to be home with family. Yeah, you know, I don't like what's happening to the economy and, and uh, obviously, you know, concerned with uh, people's health. I don't know how much of this is really necessary. Um, I don't know how how much of an impact this will really have. But, uh, you know, to err on the side of caution is probably a good idea. And you just... Uh, you just hope that people can get out of this financially. That's really all I'm concerned with. Makes sense to me. So in closing, John, any last words for the kids? You know what? Pursue your dreams. Just be smart about it. And um, generally speaking, it's not necessarily the person with the most talent that makes it, but the person with the most drive. Way aside from all that, my wife got to see you guys at Birch Hill in New Jersey. I'm going to say 97, 98. So you guys <laughs> definitely made it. Oscars, yeah. Those are, uh, those are the Oscars days. Hey. You know what? You you just uh, onward and uh, upward. Do the best you can in life, and uh, try not to limit yourself. Because uh, if you don't have limits, you'll achieve great things. Even if it isn't exactly what you envisioned, you'll still achieve something great. Great. Well, the next time we're in Vegas, which is hopefully in the near future, we will be going to your store. So thank you very much for your time, and really congratulations on this album. It's really, really something to be proud of. Glad you enjoyed it. Thank. You. Thanks, John. Take care. Outrocast. Next up is my interview with Rao from the band Enter Shikari. That band has been doing things at a big level for over 15 years now. The new album from the band is called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. Very intriguing album title. And you'll quickly learn from hearing Rao speak, this is a very smart and philosophical guy. He does a lot on the meditation and beyond music. We spoke about that. We spoke about what's coming up for the band and also what made him want to get started. Not a lot of people realize that most of the members of this band grew up together playing music. So we tapped into what it's like to be playing music for a living with guys that you grew up with playing music with after school. This one actually starts off in progress. I led off with the question about whether I had it correct that Rao produced the new Enter Shikari album himself. Yeah, yeah, I think it was important with this one. I've, like, I've learned so much over the years and, and co-produced um, our albums, but I think because this album was so vast, so varied in its like textures and emotions and stuff, and there's a lot of detail, so I think it just needed you know, sort of the the um, the creative sort of control over the, you know over the whole project, um, just to keep it, just to keep those kind of original insights, original ideas, you know, from the demos, keeping that all the way through the process and make sure we don't lose anything of the, of the original sort of yeah stems of the song. And when I think about your band, it's very impressive to me that it's been almost the original lineup since around '99, which puts your band around. 
20 years. Do I have that correct? 21 years together? Well, I mean, Ennis Shikari started in 2003, so it wasn't quite that. But but me, Chris, and Rob, so three of the four of us, have been in bands since we were like uh, 11 or something. Yeah, so, so it was late, late 90s, yeah. So what was the point where it went from being something that you did on the side to this is a career in a real cottage industry? Probably about 2006. So that was like we'd spent a few years touring up and down the UK, just playing whatever show we could get. Um, and then, yeah, we, we met our manager in 2006 and we started getting, you know, we were starting to get real kind of press then and, and, and getting actually noticed because um, we'd been sort of largely ignored um, up until then. I suppose we, we were quite sort of niche. Our, our sound was, was certainly couldn't be put into, a, a, you know, the, the normal uh, genre stratifications and stuff. Um, and yeah, just from then it all sort of exploded. But yeah, so I'd, I'd say around 2006. And of course, you've also kept busy with side projects and all that, which I do want to ask you about. But it's good to hear that it's been really a career for close to 15 years now. Did you plan when you started this band that it was going to be a career? Or is that just something that happened accidentally? No, I mean, I usually describe it as a hobby that got out of hand. Um, it was, you know, very much something that we used to just, we, we, so we, we all went to the same secondary school. We all had this like little after school job that we would do when we were like 16, 17. Um, and then after that, we'd about five, six o'clock, we'd go back to Rob, our, our drummer's house and practice. And we did that four times a week. Um, and, and that was just, you know, it was just fun. I, I loved creating music. We loved playing together and it's something that we did and then gradually as, as we started writing our, our own material and, and experimenting and uh, finding our sound and then you know we'd, we'd been playing live with each other for, for so many years since we were kids so we had this real sort of communal energy on stage and it, yeah it all just kind of blossomed from there and that same kind of thing can be said about you two Red Hot Chili Peppers, Clutch, a handful of big bands where they were kids and they turned it into a real band. Is that something that you guys had hope from growing up? Um, I probably like dreamed about it, but in more in a sort of subconscious way. I was I probably never felt sort of confident enough to dream about it. You know, like I, I'm very much a sort of realist, so I, I always thought like, no, no, what are the chances? Really, you know, it's not going to happen. Um, and then, yeah, I think it, because things happened so slowly, you know, we were touring up and down the UK for like a few years and it just felt like we were taking little, little pigeon steps. And I think that sort of taught us almost not to even worry about like making it or, you know, in, a, in inverted commas. Um, it was just all about just having a good time and just kind of developing our musicianship, developing the, the sort of creativity that we have. So it, it was cool in a way because it made us focus on like the the realness instead of getting hit up about like trying to trying to make it or, or you know whatever sort of the the kind of modernity's definition of success is. Right, right. When I talk to metal and hard rock artists that are above forty, and I ask them what was the band that got them into music and got them into this career path, they usually say Kiss or Motley Crue. When it's people who are under 40, I never get that answer. What was the band for you that really said, this is it? Was it Nine Inch Nails? Oh, God. Um, it's so hard to pick one. Um, I mean, I, as a kid, I grew up on Britpop. So it was like Oasis and Blur, I think. So Damon Albarn and Blur were probably my sort of big idols but then i started getting into heavier music as well as i became sort of a, a mid-teenager um and then it was all yeah it was all sorts of stuff really um you know everything from like hardcore punk bands um to like post-punk um I, I suppose like new order and joy division were a massive uh influence on us as well and prodigy um yeah, kind of all sorts of stuff. I think a lot of American hardcore, so like Sick of It All, Gorilla Biscuits, Youth of Today, all, all that kind of scene was very big influence on us as well. Great influences across the board there. Do you mind, though, being called 
a metal band or being thought of as metal? Because I obviously know that your music spans different genres. I mean, I'm not honestly at the point where I just don't care. <laughs> I mean, like if, if people, um, if it helps, you know, um, to, to, to kind of give people an idea of what we sound like or, you know, a, and try and put a description to the sound, then, then yeah, I think, you know, whatever people think we are, I, I don't sort of try and uh, fit any sort of mold. I know that sort of sound, sounds cliche and sort of quite self-aggrandizing or whatever, but, but no, I, I think we were lucky that we were just, we grew up around so many different types of music, like living in London, there's all sorts of stuff everywhere. So I had, you know, lots of like friends who are into different things and had all these influences on us so our, our music has, has always been sort of you know a little bit metal a little bit like electronic dance music a little bit classical music um you know it just verges all over the place really another thing that people know about you is you've done online meditation kind of courses when did meditation enter your life um probably about six years ago now um i mean i i had like you know as most of us do at some point in our life we have one year that is just horrific you know it just everything goes wrong at once and you just go through so much hardship I, I had that in 2015 so I think it was it was around then that I uh I kind of you know I knew about meditation and I think I've tried little bits of, of mindfulness here and there but um then I sort of really took it on as like a tool to to really help my mental health and you know to keep me in check keep me balanced um and it keep me more sort of self-aware, I think, as well, and, and sort of feeling in control of my, my emotions and things. Um, and, yeah, now I've, uh, recently I've been doing uh, kind of, you know, live streams of, of, of mindfulness practices that we can all join in on, you know, doing certain guided meditations for everyone. And that, that's been a lot of fun because, you know, sharing the insights that I've, I've and the experiences that I've had over the, the last few years. And outside of your band, which is basically your full-time job, you've always kept active with side projects. And we just talked about the meditation that you've led online. Are you the kind of person that wakes up every day with a to-do list? Because you seem very productive as a whole. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I was actually speaking to a, a friend the other day about this. And he, he was saying how, um, you know, a few of his, his friends had been the major complaint of lockdown. It has been boredom <laughs> for a lot of people. Um, but I, yeah, I can, I can never really, if I find myself just like sitting watching TV all day or just like be feeling bored, I'll, I'll just feel guilty and I'll be like, oh no, I, ha I have to get up and do something. I've either got to do some exercise or read a book or like, you know, watch something informative. Or, <laughs> so I've got, it's quite annoying to be honest, but um, yeah, I, I suppose I have quite a, a busy mind anyway, so I have to try and uh, keep up with it. I totally, totally relate. And it's great to see that the music is out as planned, on time, and all that. Do you know anything that's going to be happening in 2020, or are you just waiting to see how this all blows out? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's so hard to call at the moment. I mean, we're supposed to be having a UK and European tour in October, November, December. But, I mean, yeah, it, it's all, uh, you know, kind of just taking each month as it comes at the moment and seeing what happens. If we have to postpone, then we have to postpone. But hopefully at some, some point we're going to get to play uh, live and, and yeah, fill, fill these uh, these feelings and get this excitement that I'm so so longing for already. This is the longest time in my life I've gone without being on a stage since starting the band. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm already itching to, to get back to it. Yeah, well, we in New York hope to see you in the near future, whatever it takes, and all that. So being mindful of your time here. Any last words for the kids? Um, yeah, I mean just. Uh, Thank, thank you, everyone, for, for their support. Um, uh, we're so thankful for our, our audience, our, our fan base, and I hope everyone's looking after each other and sort of cherishing the, the community that we're all feeling now. Even, you know, at, at this time of hardship, it can, it, there are some silver linings that we all begin to look out for each other again. And, um, yeah, so I hope, I hope everyone's staying safe and taking care of each other and, and big up and big love. Outrocast. Last, but definitely not least, is my interview with Cherie Curry. Cherie Curry, yes, the singer of The Runaways. She's made a solo album called Boulevards of Splendor. It was a long time in the making, and that's something that we spoke about. 
Boulevard to Splendor was produced by Matt Sorum, the drummer of Guns N' Roses, The Cult, Velvet Revolver, and even other projects. And working with Matt led her to have a lot of big stars on her album, like Slash and Duff from Guns N' Roses, Billy Corgan. You'll hear more about that. But Cherie also found success as an actress over the years and also doing chainsaw art. <laughs> we spoke about all that and what it's like acting on the show Matlock. Really a delight speaking with Cherie. Hey, Darren. Hey, Cherie. How's it going there today? Okay day despite this oh. pandemic? Oh, yeah, it's great. Just doing a little bit of uh, my son has moved home. He lost his house in the Woosley Fire, and he finally has come home to where moving him around and stuff, you know, doing stuff that you need to do in the house. Exactly, exactly. And I bet Ken has you pretty busy with interviews as well. Yes. How's everything going with you? It is nonstop, but in the best of ways possible, given the circumstances. Positive disposition goes pretty far, to say the least, but it's great to have new music from you, I must say. Oh, thank you, Darren. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I really like this record. And did you know that outright Matt was going to produce it? I had the pleasure of interviewing him a couple of days ago, and it sounded like it was something that he talked you into, but at the same time, you weren't going to do an album. Well, you know what? Uh, I just didn't think it was going to happen. I mean, he was the one that really came up with the whole idea. Matt is, I mean, this guy's a go-getter. You know, he is a pro all the way. And after we opened for Joan, that night somebody approached him and said, I want to make a record with her. And, uh, of course, we ended up going with with Kenny and, and Blackheart. But um, he said, I want to do this record. We're going to do a record. We are going to do a record, Cherie. And I was like, really? You know, I, mean, I, just, I, I was thrilled at the whole prospect of it. Did I expect it? Did I expect all these great people? Absolutely not. But that's what Matt, Matt makes those things happen. When did you first meet Matt? Did you know him for decades or anything like that? I had met him. Um, at some social things, you know, fundraisers, stuff like that. And, um, he had reached out to me to do some singing on his now wife's record, but I was in the middle of doing all the promo for the runaways film. So by the time I got back to him, uh, that was already a done deal. And then I told him that, that I had been offered, uh, you know, to open for Joan at the Pacific Amphitheater. And I said, I really need to put a band together. I need to find a drummer. Do you know anyone? And he goes, I'll drum for you. And I swear I fell over. It's like, what? <laughs> and he goes, and I'll put together a band for you too. I, I, I'm so indebted to him. He put it, it, That's how I met Nick Mayberry and Grant Fitzpatrick. And I brought my son Jake on board. And it was just a killer band. And that's the band that went into the studio as well. And we toured together, minus Matt, of course. He's, he's a busy guy. But, yeah, Matt made all this happen. It, it just like in a blink of an eye. It was shocking. And do you have plans to tour behind this album once the smoke clears with all the pandemic? I think I would have to. Uh, I love these songs. I love the high energy of the of these tunes, and of course, you know I always love doing runaway songs, and they would fit right in. So I'm hoping that that happens. When I go through your discography, it amazes me that you've been able to work with so many artists that people stereotype as being difficult. Yet you seem to get along with everybody. Has that always been the case? Yeah, it actually has. I I mean I, I'm just very appreciative of people's time. And, um, you know, I, 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 I tip my hat to anybody that's in this business. And uh, I think because I started so young, I really, you know, I've seen people just become real, excuse my expression, assholes in this business uh, with fame and all that kind of stuff. And, and so, you know, I just never allowed that even in my life. So, you know, I, I give people the compliments that they deserve and it always comes from the heart. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of like what I do. But if, I, but if, if, if you're not somebody that's a nice person, trust me, 
that that's not good either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I I um, honestly am very blunt and to the point with some if I think that that they're not being true true to themselves or true for their fans. You know, I I have no problem voicing my opinion about that. And you went from one difficult industry to another by really breaking out as an actress in the 80s. Is acting something you're still interested in? You know what? I do it so rarely. And when I do do it, it's fun. Uh, it was never, hmm. I, I didn't like the cattle calls. I mean, when I, when I got Foxes, it was such a fluke because I was up against, you know, Rosanna Arquette and Christy McNichol and a bunch of other really talented actors. I didn't expect to get that part by any means because I didn't. Annie and Foxes was a buxom, curly, red-haired, full-lipped girl that I didn't look like her. But uh, somehow, I guess the writer and the director, Adrian Lyon and and Joel Blasberg, the producer, just and David Putnam thought that I was Annie. So I'm so blessed because. She was really me. <laughs> but there was no laughing involved. Right, and your acting credits does include several episodes of Matlock. Is that something you're proud of? You know, it was just fun. I just had my son, and to be able to go out and, and work with Andy Griffith, and, you know, it was fun. You know, acting to me, hmm, I mean, you you really have to develop a taste for it. Either you're meant to do it or you're not. I can pull it off, but is it something that I had to dive into uh, and that I needed? Absolutely not. I mentioned uh, Matlock specifically because that show kind of went from being legendary to a punchline to a pop culture staple that it remains all these decades later. So when you go through your discography or your filmography, it really does stick out in a kind of way to say, well, she was on Matlock. She must have had a good career in acting. Well, I was also on Divorce Court, too. Ha ha. I mean, that was a joke, you know. Um, and I played the girl with no mouth and I had no speaking line. So, you know what? The thing is, is that I just I kind of lived in the moment with all that stuff. And and uh, again, it was really fun to do that show. So. You know, it's it's an experience, and, and when you turn things down, you're turning down the experience, in my opinion. Why? You know? I, I like to challenge myself, and um, acting I've always been a whole lot more afraid of. That I can walk on stage in front of thousands of people. It doesn't bother me at all. Acting, that I do get that, that tinge in my stomach, that little bit of butterfly fear. So uh, even with a chainsaw, you know, I mean, I can handle a chainsaw a lot easier, that death-defying career than uh, acting. But you know what? Who knows? If, if somebody wants me to do something, I'll, I'll definitely do it. And the story of your album was that it was unfortunately delayed due to an accident related to the chainsaw art. Are you back on track with the chainsaw art career? Do you still have a gallery? You know what? I closed that gallery when we were in pre-production for the Runaways movie because a lot of fans were showing up with albums for me to sign and memorabilia and stuff. And, and there was one time that I was carving and I was in the zone and someone just tapped me on the shoulder, right. which just literally scared the, the Jesus out of me. And I really realized that I can't have that. I just can't because I have to focus. I can't lose my focus or I'm going to get hurt or I'm going to make a mistake, you know, that I can't fix. Cause once you take it off, it can't be put back on again. So I closed the gallery down and I built a place here next to my house. And, uh, and so I've been carving here ever since 2009. And does anyone else in your family have the passion for chainsaw art? No. <laughs> In fact, my, my family tried to stop me, especially my brother. He goes, Cherie, I forbid you to do this. I said, Don, uh, who is my younger brother, I said, this is a calling. This, I am going to do this. I can't help it. I have to. You know, that, that inner voice that drives you, that is what I followed because uh, never in my wildest dreams did I ever see myself as a chainsaw artist, ever. 
but um, it found me. So, and it's been very good to me for the last 20 years. I've read that Jesse James Dupree has a chainsaw endorsement because he's used it as a musical instrument on stage. Do you have endorsements on that end? I've always been in, well, actually I'm endorsed by Echo and that, that started probably about 18 years ago because I had bought an Echo chainsaw, but the carburetor kept going. And so I replaced the, the carburetor twice and then I had to go shoot a monster garage with legendary carver, Bob King. And I was using my Makita electric and Bob was saying, what? Of course, Echo was there. They were there at the shoot because they endorsed Bob. And they said, why are you using this? I said, oh, I've got one of your Echo saws at home. (laughs) And I said, and when I go home, I'm going to take it and I'm going to throw it in the street. Because it's a lemon and it's never worked for me. And they said, we're going to have to fix that. And which they did. They had me take it to uh, a local store up here. They set me up with a few brand new saws and they endorsed me from that moment on. So for about 18 years now, I've been endorsed by Echo. Wow. So between music, the chainsaw art, it sounds like you're creatively fulfilled all the time. I do have a lot, a lot of different avenues and I'm and also getting ready to do the audio version of my book, which uh, is going to be a, a trip for me because that's, you know, we lived, I mean, I wrote it twice. I wrote it with Neil Schusterman in 1989, which was a young adult version. And Neil Schusterman is just a brilliant writer. He did the majority of it, you know, basically through interviews. And there was one, the green limousine that I basically wrote on my own. And then when I did the adult version of it for when the movie came out, it was hard. I mean, it wasn't hard, but of course you have to relive that stuff. And, and tell the stories I couldn't tell in the young adult book. And now that I have to, you know, every word has to be exactly like that book. And, and I have to, and I guess in a way, relive it in real time, um, which is something that is going to be a learning experience, especially the kidnapping and the, the you know, the rape and all that stuff that I had to go through. I don't know exactly how I'm going to handle that, except I'm going to have to relive it. So these are like little things that I have to do that are a first for me. I like firsts. (laughs) Never a dull moment with you, it sounds like. No, actually, there isn't. No. (laughs) Well, on that note, uh, in closing, Sheree, any last words for the kids? Listen to that inner voice. Don't ever ask anybody their opinion because their path is not your path. Trust your instincts. And only one person can walk your path and it's you. So please don't think you can take these people with you. Believe in yourself. Believe in that inner voice. And I guarantee you, you will succeed. Absolutely. Thanks for checking out the Paltrowcast with Darren Paltrowitz, produced by V13 Media. Theme song by Steve Schiltz. Audio mixing by Mark Pirro. Until next time, have a great Shabbos. Paltrowcast.